Hello everyone, Steve Edelman, I'm back to talk about sensor augmented pumps. Up until recently, we've had insulin pumps over here, continuous glucose monitoring over here, and they worked in silos. The pumps only reacted to your personal changes and settings, and the CGM just gave you the data. But now we're in a whole new area uh, called sensor augmented pumps, but also the key phrase, automated insulin delivery. This is huge. And I have seen a transformation in many of my patients who have gone from pretty good control to incredible control. And that's true for myself and also uh, Jeremy Pettis. So I'm gonna slide my, share my uh, screen with you and I am going to enlarge and I'm gonna start my uh, presentation and I'm gonna be around to answer all the questions that you, you would like to have answered. So this is the title of my talk, Sensor Augmented Pumps and Automated Insulin Delivery, the Standard of Care for People with Type 1 Diabetes Until a True Cure Comes Along. So what does sensor augmented pumps and automated insulin delivery mean? Well, there's communication between the CGM and the insulin pump so that the insulin delivery is automatically given a little more, a little less, stopping, uh, uh, auto correction bolus via some type of algorithm. These are all proprietary. If any company that makes one of these systems told you, they'd have to kill you. It's very secret but in order to keep the glucose levels in range. Now, what about hybrid closed loop versus totally closed loop? Hybrid closed loop is what's on the market now. We have three of them. You still have to put in your own uh, meal announcements, how many carbohydrates you're gonna eat. Uh, the totally closed loop system, I'll talk about that very briefly at the end, that's in research trials right now, is that basically you don't do it darn thing, you just put it on. And you eat, you don't eat. You exercise, you don't exercise. You don't have to put any information in. You don't have to correct, and everything gets taken care of for you, just like an individual that does not have diabetes. So there's several hybrid closed loop systems in the market. There's the Tandem Control IQ, there's the DIY do-it-yourself looping, and you can do that with an old Medtronic pump or an Omnipod. Not the Dash, but the, uh, the slightly older Omnipod and the Medtronic 670G. That's been out for several years. They get kudos for coming out with the very first one. Um, then in development, the Omnipod folks have a program called Horizon. Medtronic's coming out with their next hybrid closed loop system called the 680G. And then we have the totally closed loop. There's lots of companies working on it. I think the one that gets the most notoriety is my good friend, Ed Damiano, uh, and the bionic pancreas. And I'm just gonna give you a touch of that at the very end of my presentation. Uh, let's see what time it is so I can stay on schedule. Now, I have a video on our TCOID website. It's called Why the A1C Sucks and the time and range is so much better because the A1C <clears throat> is an important test. It tells us what our average blood sugar has been over the past two to three months. It tells us nothing about day-to-day -day control. This patient on the top, you can see he's bouncing all over the place. Look at the patient on the bottom, very tight, right around a, a mean value. And guess what? They both have the A1C. So what's really more important is time and range. It tells us what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. It's all about time and range. Officially defined as the percent of time your blood sugars are between 70 and 180. And they do have <clears throat> time above range, and you can see those two levels uh, from one uh, above 180 to 250 and above 250, <clears throat> and then time below range less than 70 and then less than 54. And you can see the goal range is there. So think, think of 70%, that's where you wanna be and you do wanna minimize your time below range. Here's a typical case, you see, look at that estimated A1C, 5.7, uh, average blood sugar 98, that is low. 
standard deviation 34, pretty tight. Our goal for standard deviation is 50 or less. And look at the time and range, 72%. But one other thing that's pretty important, 24% of the time, this patient is in the hypoglycemic range. And you can see down, uh, he gets down overnight. So that's an issue we see all the time. This is a case where average A1C is nine, average blood sugar 212, and look at that, they set their high alert at 390. Now, this last case shows an average blood sugar 182, standard deviation all over the place, 69. Look what's happening right here. Time and range, terrible, less than 50%. This person's going up at night, and not only going up, quite variable. That's why the standard deviation is 69. Now, why did I show you these three cases? Very specifically because the current hybrid closed loop systems on the market can take care of these problems. Absolutely. Uh, and so that's why I want to get you excited to learn about these systems and potentially get on one. So this is one of my favorite slides. Up until recently, up until recently, the best way to control type 1 diabetes, stand perfectly still, do not eat a thing. And that is true. You get your basal rate set, you're golden. But now there are other ways we can get really good control. So here's the hybrid closed loop systems. And hybrid closed loop really means it's a, it's a basal rate modulating system. And you're gonna learn that some of these newer systems can give micro boluses, correction boluses as well. So you can reduce and almost eliminate your lows. So, you, which is also called time below range. You can reduce your time above range, TBR. I guess it should be TAR, sorry about that typo. It'll help you strike the spike, bouncing up after eating, It'll improve your time and range, uh, less day-to-day -day frustration, and improve quality of life. And that is without question for the vast majority of users and big time bragging rights with your friends. I'll tell you what, Jeremy and I, we, we battle over who has the best time and range. And you know what? Sometimes he's killing it and sometimes I am. So, you know, we know diabetes isn't that steady all the time. So I just want to show you kind of very typical numbers you can get. There's the Dexcom download for the percent time and range over the prior week. You can see that's July 17th, pretty darn recent. Look at that, 98, 92, 97, 97, 90, 97. Had a terrible day on Thursday, 86% time and range. And of course, I'm kidding because the goal is anything above 70 and then you can see the average blood sugar is 140 which is basically an estimated a1c of 6.6 percent very tight standard deviation 24 and average time and range for the week 99 percent not bad not bad at all now what about using the trend arrows and this is really important it sets up the stage on how these hybrid closed loop systems work. Well, Dr. Pettis and I uh, did a uh, questionnaire, 222 successful CGM users with type one diabetes. And we asked them, what is the, what is the most useful feature of CGM? And they said the real-time trend arrows and the real-time high and low alerts. What did they use the least? The retrospective download. Who cares about what happened in the past? I know it's important to download because you wanna pick up trends and patterns that you can discuss with your uh, healthcare professional and of course, look at yourself. And I think this slide really explains it the best. Using rate of change, the uh, limits of the finger stick. You can see that here's a blood sugar of 220 with the blood sugars dropping dramatically two arrows down. Here's, here's a 220 with two arrows up. So in the upper scenario, you're not gonna take any insulin you're dropping like crazy. You're gonna wait till the blood sugar levels off before you decide to take any carbohydrates. And the scenario on the bottom, you're going up three or more milligrams per deciliter per minute, and you're shooting up. So you're not gonna give your usual correction for 220. You're gonna probably double that if you're smart. 
And if you're using a home glucose monitor and not using a CGM, you're stuck with the same old value. You don't know if it's going up or down. And that's why life is so frustrating when you have type one, because you don't know if you're correcting when you're dropping or going up. Uh, so this is just a, a very clear example of why every person with type one needs to have a CGM and the importance of the trend arrow. Now you can see the data from this questionnaire that when patients wanted to correct at 220, when their blood sugar was flat and stable, the, the average correction dose was three units. So one unit for every 30 milligrams per deciliter, bring them down from 220 to 120. But with two arrows up, you can see that these folks were giving themselves 6.8 units. And two arrows down, a mean dose of 1.5. So take a look at this, that the dose can vary between 1.5 and 6.8 units just on the trend arrow. It just shows you how important it is. Now, we have given directions on what to do with the trend arrow when you're dosing your insulin. And from this graph, and if, if I'm speaking too quickly, you can go back and look at the reruns and freeze it right here. Um, that if your blood, if you have a trend arrow that's diagonal up, we know your blood sugar is going to go up 25 to 50 milligrams per deciliter in the next 30 minutes. So you should correct for that number. Whatever your blood sugar is, you add 50 points, let's say, and then whatever that total value is, you correct for that value, whatever your correction factor is. If it's two arrows up, you're, you're going to add 100 milligrams per deciliter to whatever your blood sugar is right now then you correct for that value. And then of course, on the way down, you know, the most prudent thing to do is just wait until your arrow uh, becomes horizontal and then figure out if you still need to um, correct. <coughs> Product placement, you can get them online. Okay, so here's an important point. Insulin dosing should be based on the predicted glucose value 30 minutes into the future. That may change with different insulins. However, with the insulins we have on the market, that's, it's a pretty good uh, rule of thumb. What are other variables? Insulin on board, duration of insulin action, carbohydrates on board, anticipated exercise, and sleeping. And guess what? This is exactly what a hybrid closed loop can incorporate into the automatic insulin delivery. Think about that. Okay, let's talk about the Tandem Control IQ that just came out at the beginning of this year. And they call it the Advanced Hybrid Closed Loop System. Why advanced? I'll tell you in one second. It's designed to improve your time and range. And that means increase the percent of time between 70 and 180, less highs, less lows. And take a look at that third bullet point. <clears throat> It, it adjusts insulin delivery based upon 30 minute predicted CGM values, including, and this is why it's called advanced, an automatic correction bolus up to one per hour as needed. And I'm gonna get into the details. So what do you need? You need a tandem X2 insulin pump and a Dexcom G6 continuous glucose monitor. Now the algorithm is embedded within the insulin pump. Remember what I told you? I, I can't tell you anything more about the algorithm. It's, they're proprietary. Okay, now let's just go through some of the system here of the control IQ. Remember, I can't overemphasize this enough. Every insulin adjustment is based on the predicted CGM value in 30 minutes. So basically, if your blood sugar is over 180, it's gonna give you a correction dose every hour. And it, what it's gonna do, it's gonna subtract, it's only gonna give you 60% as if you were calculating yourself, and it's, it's gonna subtract any insulin on board. It's gonna increase your basal rate if it predicts you're gonna be 160 or greater in 30 minutes, and it's gonna decrease your basal rate if it predicts you're gonna be less than 112.5. So during the regular setting, the control IQ, has a range that it's going to try to keep you in 112.5 to 160. Now, where did they get to 112.5? I have no clue. Um, and if it predicts you're going to hit 70 or less in 30 minutes, to stop your insulin delivery. Now, 
you have to remember this is a hybrid closed loop, not a totally closed loop. You still have to bolus for the carbs and anything else you need. You might have to bolus uh, for protein and fat as well. And you know what this tracing reminds me of? I have a kind of a strange mind. I look at tracings and I think of, what does that remind me of? Well, Homer Simpson, of course. And of course, we all feel that way when our blood sugar shoots to 325 after eating. Now, what about control IQ during exercise? Remember, everything's based on the predicted CGM value in 30 minutes. So the goal changes. Instead of 112.5 to 160, it's 140 to 160. It'll still give you correction bolus, but not above 160, but instead over 180. It'll, it'll still increase your basal rate if it, if, if it predicts you're gonna be over 160, and it'll decrease your basal rate if it predicts you're gonna to get to 140 or below. And you can see how that 140 uh, replaces the 112.5 when you're not exercising. And instead of stop, stopping your pump delivery at less than 70, it's gonna do it at less than 80. Now, what about sleeping? There's Jeremy and I when we used to fly around the country, but of course not anymore. Um, just to let you know that the correction boluses are not given uh, if you're in the sleep mode. You preset when you are sleeping, whether you know whatever, according to your personal habits, and it keeps you in a very tight range, not one, not one twelve to one sixty, one twelve point five to one twenty, very tight. It'll also stop your insulin delivery if you are uh, going to be pricked. If, you, if you're gonna get below 70 in 30 minutes. So um, there are all kinds of little adjustments you can make individually. I'm not gonna go into it now. I wanted to give you the standard settings. Here's a picture of the download that we might look at in clinic and you can look at it at home. Um, first of all, you have the glucose levels. You can see it's color coded above, within, and below uh, uh, range. Then it looks at your insulin bolusing and uh, it has different codes. They're all at the bottom. It <laughs> takes a while to get used to it. I can just tell you as an example, this little square with a, with a little droplet in it, that's, one, that's an auto correction. And you can see that there's this little signia says Z's, this person's sleeping. And you see they went to sleep at night on the right. And then there's exercise in there. And so there's all these little codes that you need to learn. And third, look at the basal rate. Uh, this is the basal rate that you set. And this person looks like they have uh, two different basal rates. And you can see that sometimes the basal rate is above what their set is, and sometimes it's below, and sometimes it's completely off. And you can sort of see that right here, right before 12 uh, p.m., the blood sugars are dropping down, and so is the insulin delivery. Um, and so you can always see that correlation. Here's the blood sugar going up to 183 and the insulin basal rate is increasing right away. Okay, so this is the way that we can analyze and look for trends and patterns. Now there's also the T-Connect phone app. You can see it uh, on the snapshot of my iPhone. And once again, you can look at your basal rate. There's all kinds of things you can look at. Almost everything that I showed you on the previous screen, your last bolus, and of course, this was the rage bolus when nothing happened with the two previous boluses. You can always override all the settings and, and crash on your own. Um, this is just a summary of the different settings of the control IQ. And I'm not here to, to have you memorize things, just to let you know that there's the regular mode, there's the sleep mode and the exercise mode. And this is how the system is set up. And I'd imagine that as time goes on, there will be software updates to maybe improve and change these uh, once these uh, control IQ units are being used uh, out in the real world. Okay, now we're getting to the second system. How am I doing on time? Okay, pretty good. So this is called looping. DIY, do it yourself, hybrid closed loop. You can do it with an old hackable Medtronic pump, very old, not the newer, not the 530G and things like, not the 530G and newer, um, but you can use a smartphone, an Apple Watch, uh, and you have to get a Riley link. And I'm gonna show you a picture of that in a second. And the Dexcom G6. 
it's it's and there's differences between the each one but the but the omnipod not the dash one it's always in auto mode and of course because you're using the g6 you don't have to calibrate it. and just to emphasize it's not fda approved uh, this is do-it-yourself open source software here's a picture of the riley link uh, if you, for some of you engineers there's there's the inside of it a little computer thing don't ask me <laughs> what it is, uh, and they have an app, and that's what it looks like, the looping app. And you see I have one text and only 43,675 emails and um, 280 phone calls to catch up with. Now, here's a picture of the app when you're looking at it. Uh, first of all, it has your blood sugar. The dark blue dots is your current blood sugar, and then you can see that the dashed lighter blue line is your predicted. Like all these hybrid closed loop systems, you have to be honest. You gotta put in the carbs. You have to uh, be truthful with it. Don't try to trick it, just be honest. And then the predictions are way better. Then you can see active insulin. You can see the insulin delivery. You can see that little, any little triangle like this is a bolus. Uh, everything above that line is more than your average basal rate, which is like 0.6, and, and anything below is reduced basal rate. And you have your active carbohydrates. And just to let you know, there are very interesting, interesting places you can put your Omnipod. And if, that's my neck, but uh, I have extensively tried both looping and the control IQ, and I can tell you, they're both excellent. And it comes down to personal choice. Now here's a picture of the night vision with your, with your phone. And just to show you, it works with the iPhone. And uh, right here where that blue arrow is separates out your, your blood sugar and the trend going down uh, compared to the predicted blood sugar over time. So theoretically, I should come in for a smooth landing right around 100. I can't remember what happened, to be honest with you. So pre-Control IQ, Dr. Pettis was on looping, and he was on low carbs. And you can see his results. Only 100% time and range. Average 130, standard deviation 27. Look at that 24-hour profile there. And of course, you know, he never gives up a chance to brag and to show off. So I want to give you an idea of some of my data before and after sensor augmented pumps. So I showed you this already on the left-hand side that um, you know I've had every day above 90% except one day at 86. And in May 27th, you can see it over on the right. <clears throat> I had one day of 91. I had two days uh, in the 60s and the rest above 70%, not bad. I, I wasn't that unhappy with that. 63%, um, yeah, it's not the end of the world, and I hope none of you feel that way, but we're trying to get above 70%. And I can tell you, I can honestly look you straight in the camera and say it was without any extra work. And that's key. Okay, let's talk about the Medtronic 670G, and then we'll finish up my lecture. I want to give Medtronic kudos for coming out with the first 670G, the first hybrid closed loop, several years ago. And they are coming out with the 680G. So it was the first base rate modulator. Uh, they don't have auto correction boluses. It works well overnight like other systems. It still requires meal announcement, carbohydrate input, like other systems. Uh, the problem, one of the issues is the sensor. Um, requires calibration and to keep it in auto mode you have to calibrate up to four times a day and that is a pain i have to say uh, no sharing capability in real time so none of your loved ones can see your blood sugars maybe that's a good thing uh, and uh, i do believe that uh, the next 680g will have bluetooth uh, and when i when i talk to people who have been on this system if you really put a lot of work into it, it can, it can really do well with you, but, but it, your daily tasks are not decreased. 
And that's a consistent finding from 670G users. Um, okay, now this is just a, an early uh, study where they showed patients pre uh, going to the 670G on the left and then to the right. And you can see obviously the standard deviation and the fluctuations are much improved. Okay, gonna finish up with, with stuff that's in the near future, not distant future. The bionic pancreas called the islet. Now think about this. We're doing these studies at UCSD. Uh, Dr. Pettis is the principal investigator. Whoops, there's no carb counting needed. There's no setting carb to insulin ratio. There's no setting basal rates. There's no setting insulin correction factors. All you do is put your body weight and it learns about you. It learns about your sensitivity. And um, you can see from this islet that there's two infusion ports, one for insulin, one for glucagon. Now the first studies are gonna be insulin only. And you can see here that you're, you're comparing on the left-hand side usual care versus insulin only versus the faster acting aspart uh, made by Novo all the way on the right. And you can see it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. One thing I wanna point out, you look at a patient uh, down here, This every line represents the patient in the study. You can see that they're, they're pretty low. Uh, and it, it, it tells me uh, to tell you that a lot of times when people are having a lot of hypo and they go on these hybrid closed loop systems or totally closed loop systems, their A1C, comes up a little bit because you're getting rid of the lows. And that's a good thing. It's an excellent thing. Now, this is a slide looking at insulin only on the left and the bihormonal system on the right. Now, at first glance, and, and I just want to mention the glucagon formulation is Dazi glucagon made by Zeeland. At first glance, you might say, gee, there's not much of a difference. But take a look on the right. Time and range goes from 71% to 79%, and the percent of patients with an A1C less than seven goes from 50% to 90%. That's probably because they were sort of hovering at that 7% range when they enrolled in the study. So that's why that number is so great. So um, we have a lot of exciting stuff uh, coming in the very near future. This is a picture of some of my patients. They're all on hybrid closed loop. I hope they don't walk into a telephone pole or anything like that. So with that, I want to say uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. And now Dr. Pettis is going to help me answer questions uh, during the Q&A, whether you typed them online or uh, whether you're going to stay and type them in right now. Don't forget, you can go to the TCOID website and an answer any, write down any question that you did not get answered, and we will get back to you and we'll answer every single question. And I'm going to say, it's been nice talking to you all. Hope to meet you in person someday. All right, <clears throat> here I am. I'm back. So, you know, I enjoyed watching that talk um, along with you guys, hearing Steve's kind of comments on this. So I think my overall take is that these systems have come a long way. You know, I, I've been on pretty much every diabetes measurement that you can imagine over the last, you know, 20 years or so, shots, pumps, inhaled insulin, you name it. Um, and, you know, I, I've always pushed continuous glucose monitors because I think they're invaluable in terms of the alerts and the information that you got. But I was kind of indifferent to pumps. You know, if you wanted to do pumps or shots, I, I, I wasn't going to push, you know, pumps on somebody. I think for the longest time, people with type 1 diabetes have felt that if they weren't on a pump, they were a bad person. But it's really about you know getting ideal as best control as you can to something that fits your lifestyle. But I want to say that with the invention of these hybrid closed loop systems, I'm changing my tune a little bit because these systems are now doing things that you just can't do with with shots um, alone, a basal insulin alone in particular, um, because these things can modulate how much insulin you're getting overnight. Um, you know you're not going to wake up every you know five minutes and measure your blood sugar and, and adjust your insulin or inhaled insulin or whatever it might be. So these have really been a game changer. And I realize there's a, a large swath of, of, um, of you out there, you know, several hundreds of folks now watching this, and some of you maybe you've never heard of a pump before, and some of you have been on pumps for years and been on, you know, one of these systems for a long time. So it, it, it 
just depends on where you are. And if you've never heard about these systems, at least now you know what they're capable of doing. So if it, you know, what you heard sounds like something interesting to you, it's, it's worth talking to your provider about, hey, I heard about these new systems, can I, can I try it out? A lot of these systems, when you try it, they'll let you get on it for a month or so and you can kind of return it um, and, and get you know, refunded and stuff like that. So you do have an opportunity to kind of try it. And then for you guys that have been on these systems for a while, I think it's now just learning all the little ins and outs of you know, what you do with your basal rates and, and carb ratios and, and, and things like that now that we're on these systems. Personally, I found that I've been able to be a little bit more aggressive with, with things across the board in terms of a little bit more basal, a little bit more aggressive carb and sensitivity factor because now on the low side, you have these pumps that can kind of shut off um, and stop giving you insulin so you, so you don't go low. So I, I'm glad to see kind of a lot of the, uh, the comments coming in. Um, you know, just a, a few questions that I wanted to answer in terms of things that are coming. All these, these, um, these companies are working on the next iteration. There, nobody is intending on stopping here by any means. Um, so the ultimate goal is to have a fully closed loop. And closed loop just means that, you know, it measures the blood sugars, it delivers insulin, it does that round and around without involving you at all. So you're cut out of the loop. Right now with these systems, you still have to bolus for carbs and things like that. So the idea is a fully automated system and we're really getting there. So Steve mentioned this beta bionics product, which is not, it's interesting for a couple of reasons that they're initially gonna release it with insulin only and then maybe with insulin and glucagon, insulin to bring your blood sugars down, glucagon to bring your blood sugars up. So that's one thing that's interesting, but what I really love about it is that when you go on that system, and this is hopefully coming out in a year or two, I'm not talking 20 years down the road, this is around the corner. When you go on this system, you enter your weight and that's it. No carb ratio, sensitivity factors, um, no basal rates. And it starts learning you know, what you need in terms of, of insulin delivery. And then when you eat, instead of saying I'm eating 37.263 square root of pi carbs, um, you just say I'm eating a typical amount of carbs for this time for lunch more than usual or less than usual. So moving diabetes to more of a qualitative way of, of that we all think. Most people don't know how many carbs they're eating. Most people don't know how to count carbs. Most people with diabetes, including myself, are not good at counting carbs. It's hard to do. So what I'm looking forward to in the next few years of all these systems is better control with less work. And that's really what we want. So we've had some breakthroughs now. These systems are, are really game changers, especially again overnight and waking up with good blood sugars. But in the next couple of years, you know, Steve and I joke that um, maybe we won't be needed as endocrinologists. Um, you know, I'd be happy to be put out of a job by these systems that can really kind of take over. And of course, it's all about access and making sure people can get these things. But I'm hopeful that, you know, if we learn as a society that if you put people on these devices and control their blood sugars, they, they stay healthy. And insurance companies, I'm hoping, will buy in that this is less complication to dialysis and, and things to, to deal with that are expensive. So I really think these will be win, 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 win. And for me, obviously it's all about the patient. Um, so some other questions that have just come up during the day. Um, a lot of people have been asking about weight and you know, I'm realizing we don't have a specific talk on that um, today for type ones. And I think one is to realize that uh, problem, it's not even problems, it's issues around weight are common for everybody you know, in the US pretty much. But especially for people with diabetes, type one and type two. I said in the beginning of the day that two thirds of us type ones in the country now are either overweight or obese. So I think there's this misconception that type ones are all thin and you know, super fit and stuff like that, but we can gain weight just like anybody else. And unfortunately, it's the, it's the usual stuff. It's all about calories in, calories out. You know, keeping your, your total caloric amount down, exercising to burn calories. On top of that, there are other medications that can help. Similin is the one approved adjunctive therapy for type ones. It's another injection before every meal, but can help you lose a little bit of weight, use less insulin. And a lot of type ones now are using these other medications called GLP ones and SGLT2 inhibitors, which are, are commonly used or, or been approved for type twos for a long time, but some type ones are using them now. There are some side effects that you definitely need to, to be aware of. And these medications um, are not approved for type one, which means it can, they can be difficult to get but they definitely can help people lose weight and um, get blood sugars down a little bit. So it's worth um, knowing about that. I'll mention that on our talk, October 3rd, one conference, we'll do a whole talk on these other therapies um, because it's needed. Everybody with type one needs insulin, but it's nice to start exploring other medications that can help with weight, 
um, and um, you know, using less insulin, help with blood pressure, all these other things. So let me just pull up the Q&A and see if I can do it in kind of real time, looking through these questions quickly. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of, you know, seeing comments about insurance and coverage and things like that. Another nice thing that we're moving towards with, for example, with the, the tandem pump, well, let me back up. It used to be that, you know, every time a new upgrade came out, you needed a new physical pump and that could be hard to get. And if you were living with type one, you'd be like, well, I don't know if I want to commit to this pump because what if something else comes out in a year and I'm locked in for five years? So the tandem pump, for example, now is a, is a downloadable platform. So when they went from their previous model that just had the low glucose suspend to now the control IQ, which does the high and low side, it's a software upgrade. So, you know, you're still, you still have the same pump. Um, you can just upgrade it. So I think that's going to be helpful. It'll be more like, you know, iPhones and smartphones that you can download the latest version, um, which I think will help with kind of um, coverage, et cetera. You know, still a lot of questions about a Frezza. Um, again, the, the mankind, the company that makes a Frezza is mankind. So the booth says mankind. So it's a little confusing. So you could definitely check it out. Um, I think I mentioned this before. It's obviously, it's a very good rapid acting insulin. Nothing works as fast as a Frezza in terms of, you know, dealing with a high carb meal or bringing down, um, high blood sugars. There's a lot of questions about combining it with, uh, a, a hybrid closed loop system, whether it's a 670G control IQ looping, whatever it might be. In general, it works very well because you can take a Frezza at the beginning of the meal to, to cover any kind of carbs. And then the system can give you more insulin to cover, you know, fat and protein later, or you can bolus through the pump. You can do all these kind of sophisticated combinations of the Frezza with a pump if you want to. Um, if you use a lot of a Frezza, um, it can just make the total daily dose in your pump look much less. So the pump thinks that you're much more insulin sensitive than you are. So it can affect the, the algorithm slightly. Um, hopefully, you know, changes will come with that with, with loop. For example, the latest update with that is that you can actually tell it that you're giving yourself exogenous insulin. So it doesn't kind of mess up the algorithm. And there's no set thing I can say that if you use a Frezza this much, it's going to mess up the algorithm or not. But certainly if you're using it just intermittently a couple times a week, no big deal. Um, even if you're using it daily, it, it, it still might work for you. So it's something that um, you can definitely try. Um, you know, other updates, Medtronic is coming out with their next system, the 7 Series. Um, still going to be using their sensors. So we're hopeful to get that update kind of in the next year. So basically, it's going to be the same kind of environment where every pump company is coming out with their next thing. However, the next thing now is always going to be more integration with continuous glucose monitoring and more changes to the algorithms to make them, you know, more aggressive. So to me, it's, it's really interesting to be giving this talk right now because, I mean, if we did this talk two years ago, and certainly three years ago, you know, there wouldn't be much to talk about. And now we have multiple systems on the market um, that people can choose for them that, that make a, you know, a real big difference. Um, so let me see if I can pull up the Q and A, see if there's any more specific thoughts. Um, other comments about, you know, other therapies, people asking about cure therapies and things like that, pancreas transplantation. So, you know, this is a good way to talk about the bigger picture in type one diabetes. And we always talk about these systems as, as a bridge to a cure that yes, these systems are amazing. Um, thank God for continuous glucose monitors and pumps, but none of us want, want to wear these devices, right? I mean, if we could strip these off and not have diabetes, that's the ultimate goal. So there's obviously still a lot of ongoing research, um, but it's going to be years and years um, till we truly have, you know, what I would call a cure. Um, so, you know, there's nothing really right on the horizon. And when people talk about cure, you have to be careful about what they're talking about. There's a lot of, you know, work going on to like preventing type 1 diabetes, and that's where we've actually had some recent success with a medication recently shown that in, in people that are at risk for type 1 diabetes, this one particular medication um, called teplizumab can actually prevent the, or delay the onset of type 1 diabetes by two years. So hopefully next year, we might have a first therapy that we could screen individuals at risk, and that's usually family members. So I have type 1 diabetes. I could screen my kids to see if they're at risk with these autoantibodies. If they come back positive, then we might have a therapy to give them to help try to prevent them from ever getting type 1 or at least delaying it. Because um, trust me, I'd rather have a kid diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when they're eight versus six. You know, two years can be a big difference in terms of 
a child's development and also in terms of what's going on in the diabetes world. Think about what we had two years ago versus today, it's changing so rapidly. So that's kind of our first movement in a cure direction. Um, but for us, you know, folks currently living with type one diabetes, it's all about therapies to try to replace beta cells and ways of, of basically transplanting these. The issues are that when you transplant something, you usually have to take immunosuppressive medications, which can cause a lot of side effects. Um, so there are pancreas transplants that you can do and islet cell transplants, but these are generally, especially the, the pancreas transplants are major surgeries. The number of pancreases we have in the country is very limited. Um, it takes you know, a lot of these immunosuppressive medications to go on this. So these are therapies we reserve for people that typically already need a kidney transplant or something anyways. It's not for the masses. It's something to be honest, I wouldn't want um, if I could avoid, uh, which hopefully I can. Because because these systems are doing a really good job now in terms of improving people's blood sugars, you know, reducing hypoglycemia. So still a lot of work to be done um, in this area. Um, so kind of stay tuned. And the other big, you know, kind of caveat to that is that we've also looked at if when somebody's newly diagnosed, are there therapies we can give to 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 keep them, you know, because when someone's diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, they still have 10, 20% of their beta cells left. And wouldn't it be nice to preserve at least those beta cells? And we've all tried all different kinds of medications when people are first diagnosed to give them medications to preserve their beta cells. And so far, nothing's worked is the bottom line. So, um, you know, those questions were coming up and I think those are good questions. So I would say big picture, you know, as Steve did a really good job of going over the different pluses and minuses of these systems. Hopefully it's at least kind of what your whistle to, to know what's available and maybe giving you information if you guys are already on it on how, how to tweak these things. I think that's really two parts. You know, I got on the control IQ system and I've been tweaking it a little bit to kind of get the most out of it. And to be honest, we're learning a lot from you guys, the patients coming back and saying, oh, you know, what happens if I keep control IQ and sleep mode all the time? Or what if I don't use it at all? Or, you know, when should I use exercise mode, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot to still be learned of kind of the best ways to use this. Um, so as long as you're using it safely and getting good results, then you know, I think you can tweak these things in, in uh, collaboration with your provider. So I, I, think, um, I think I'll stop there with my, my little kind of overview um, because I wanna make sure everyone gets a second and then we have our closing session with Carrie Sparling starting in three minutes. Carrie is fantastic. She is amazing. She's a good friend of mine, has type one diabetes since she was uh, six. Um, has had a blog about it for a long time, written a book, and just gives a really good, just kind of colorful, fun uh, description of life with type 1 diabetes and hopefully leave you with some, you know, inspiration. So that's going to be our last talk. And then I'm going to kind of wrap up the day, but the, the, the health booths will be open too at the end of the day for you guys to visit. And then again, keep an eye out for an email where we're going to send a link so you can, you can watch these, these videos again. And particularly for my, my first talk I did earlier today, the shared medical appointment, the one that's going to go online is a longer version, which actually even talks about more stuff. And then again, a plug to, to mark October 3rd on your calendar and go to the TCOID website for our one conference, which is all for us type ones, um, lectures from really honestly, some of the best people that we could get to give these, these, these talks, really the best of the best of everything you want to hear about with, um, with type one diabetes. So uh, with that, I am going to stop talking.